Okay. Dear kind of merciful Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come before you once again. We ask that as we prepare to begin, that your grace will be with us. Open our hearts and our mind that we may comprehend the vastness of this message. These are the things we ask in his son Jesus' name. Amen. Again, welcome, 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 welcome to NHTLH International Training. Uh, I had a chance to do the previous lecture, and we're going to continue where we left off. The last lecture, we ended with the daily schedule. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and show you what a three-meal schedule looks like. I'll also go right ahead and show you what a two-meal schedule looks like. So in that way, you will have an understanding that if individuals are looking to do a three-meal, um, what can one do to do a three-meal? How does one schedule a three-meal? If someone is looking to do a two-meal plan, what does one need to do to do a two-meal plan? Um, there's, there's, you know, some calculation and little technicalities that needs to take place um, if one is actually looking to do a schedule. So be mindful that doing the schedule requires, you know, a little technicality here and there. Okay. So with the three meal plan, here are the basic um, requirements or suggestions that we would recommend for a three meal plan. As you look right here, you see that the way you fill in the times don't start off by going to time to get up. That's not how you put your, your schedule together. What you do when you're getting ready to put a schedule together, the first thing to do, kind of more look at breakfast. Okay, that should be the first thing you fill in when looking to fill your schedule. Now, how do you uh, set the time? How does one set the time if they're looking to fill in for breakfast. Very simple. Um, basically, determine if you want two meals or if you want three meals. If you want three meals, I just kind of give you some basic principle. If you want three meals, this is what we are told. We are told in the spirit of prophecy that you need to be in bed, you need to be asleep before 10 p.m. Okay? That's what we are told. So, the next thing that we are told is that the last meal needs to be taken a minimum of three hours before bedtime. So if we have to be asleep before 10 p.m., that means you would have at least been in bed by 9.30 and asleep before 10. I hope you're following me where I'm going. So the last meal, to give the last meal three hours, the last thing that can actually enter your mouth has to completely enter and complete it by um, 6.30. Because from 6.30 to 9.30, you'd have had three hours. And the last item needs to have been taken before three hours before bedtime, bedtime being 9.30, asleep before 10 p.m. at night. So these are the things that Spirit of Prophecy talks about. So, um, so keeping that in mind, uh, th there's a little balancing act that needs to take place. And here's the balancing act. If you have to be in bed before 10, or better yet, you're in bed by 9.30, asleep before 10, and the last meal needs to be at least three hours before bedtime, we know that the last meal needs to be between 6 and 6.30. Remember, we work with a three-meal plan. That would mean now, if you count um, five hours, and here's another principle, the meals need to be spaced at least five hours apart. So if you count five hours back from 6 to 6.30, um, your five hours will drop you um, between 12 and 1. Okay, so in that way, you know, lunch needs to be taken between 12 and 1. Okay, and then if you count five hours back from 12 to 1, 
you know, breakfast needs to be at least six to seven or earlier. Okay, six to seven, the latest or earlier. So just to kind of give you some idea in terms of the calculation, the technicality that actually works behind the scene um, in terms of the menu. So you kind of get an idea of how I'm going. So as we go through the menu, you'll understand why I have things set the way they are set. The next thing that you also need to keep in mind now, and these are ways that we're going to figure out who qualifies for a three meal and who qualifies for a two meal. Because there's some individuals that are going to say, I want three meals. But guess what? Their schedule does not permit them to consume three meals. The most that they can consume is two meals based on their schedule. So here are the things that you need to keep in mind when it comes to your schedule. You need to keep in mind, well, what time do you actually leave home? What time do you literally leave home? Now, if you literally leave home at 6.30, and it takes at least 30 minutes to get to work, it may not be a good idea to eat between 6 and 7. What might be a better idea is a 5 to 6 meal time or maybe even a 5.30 to 6.30 meal time. So in that way, you'll get a chance to eat and you can do a digestive walk also too. So the time that you leave home to head to work will also affect what time you schedule breakfast. Now, if you're the type where you can get to work extremely early and isolate yourself and still maintain your schedule, then work is not that big of a deal then. We can just work around the schedule. Um, if it takes you 30 minutes to get to work, we have you leave home um, at about 5.30 in the morning. You get to work for 6 o'clock and then you'll have your breakfast between six and seven. You know, but my goal is, is not to have you in a work environment when you're getting ready to eat. I would actually like for you to have peace and quiet when you're actually preparing to eat. And the reason being is that if for some reason that um, you find that you're stressed or um, or maybe looking at what's going on at your office or doing some other things, it will affect digestion. Um, and you will not be able uh, to, to fully um, enjoy that breakfast or you will not be able to fully uh, be able to eat that breakfast in peace without any issue at all. So, am I making sense so far, saints? So, keep that in mind that um, the time you leave for work affects your schedule. Now, when you're doing your lunch schedule, the other thing that you need to do is that you need to keep in mind if you do any special activities over the weekend that are not able, that you don't have any control over. Like, for example, church. Whether or not you go to church on, on Saturday or whether or not you go to church on Sunday. You know, let's say you go to church on Saturday and you know that you go to a church that normally ends at about 1.30 in the afternoon. If you go to a church that normally ends at 1.30, then setting lunch between 12 and 1 would not be good because when that 12 to 1 time come and it's time to eat, service is still going on and you may not want to, you know, get up and walk out of service uh, while, while the pastor is preaching or, the, you know what I mean, or deep topic is being discussed. So then you run into a little problem, do you know? You're going to miss that spiritual food um, for the physical food. So... You kind of try to figure out, okay, what do I do? You know, you have, you have to decide. So here's the situation. 
if you still choose to schedule your lunch between 12 and 1, then what you may want to do is that on the church day, you may want to fast. Okay? You may want to fast between the 12 to 1. Um, and you got to keep in mind now that the time you fast, you'll have to fast every week on Saturday, 12 to 1, especially if the service is going to end at 12.30. Uh, I'm sorry, 1.30. So keep that in mind. So during the schedule, there's a little art, there's a little technique that has to go into it in terms of technicality when you're putting the schedule together. So with that being said and the explanation being given, we can go straight now into making the schedule. Um, the schedule, as you can see, first thing you want to do is to put in your breakfast time. And as you, uh, um, as you can see for breakfast time, it's 6 to 7. Right after breakfast, you have to go for a short walk. It's 15 minutes. And saints, here's what I want you to do. Everyone that is listening to, to the lecture right now, start putting together a schedule for yourself so you can have some level of regularity in your life. You see the schedule right here? It may seem simple, but you want to know something? For people who are dealing with acid reflux, digestive issue, any form of digestive issue or acid reflux, if you follow this schedule for at least three to five days, you'll completely reverse that acid reflux. Okay? So it is important that you follow the schedule. I can definitely tell you that anytime I speak to someone and right off the get-go, they tell me they're not on a schedule, I know that their breath will not be fresh. I know also, too, that they will have some level of digestive issue. Okay? Because any time you're off schedule, fermentation is going to take place in the gut. When that fermentation takes place, depending on um, how that fermentation is produced or what causes it, as I'm saying, producing um, what causes it, it can cause as much as 32 ounces of alcohol from intestinal fermentation. And you'll find that that can come right up and sour the bread. So no matter how much what you do or gum you chew, the bread will always have that foul odor simply because of the fact that you're not eating on schedule, on time, at all times. So it is important that one maintains a regular schedule. Um, and I, I can tell you also, too, someone comes up to me and I smell their breath right off the get-go. I don't even have to ask. I know they're off schedule. I know they do not have a schedule. And... To get the bad bread, it doesn't occur overnight. It would have, have to be a habitual situation for that bad bread to come. So when I speak to individuals and I get close to them and I automatically smell the bread, I, they can say all they want. They can say, oh, brother, look, I'm normally on a schedule. And blah, blah, blah. I know that it cannot be that way. And the reason being, the way the laws of health work, there's a cause to effect and there's an effect to cause. If someone tells me the disease right off the get-go, many times I can tell you which laws they violate. If someone tells me the violation, many times I can tell you which diseases they are more likely to have based on the violation. So remember this, that it is important that individuals eat on schedule, on time, at all times. Am I making sense here, Saints? Okay, I see someone is saying, so every Saturday, um, someone is asking a question. They're saying, so every Saturday I need to fast from 12 to 1. Um, I didn't understand. Now, saints, follow me here. You need to write your questions down. If you ask me questions in the midst of my presentation, you're going to totally throw off the whole presentation. So what you do, just keep your questions there, write them on the side. So at the end in Q&A, we can go back and address these questions. And it's very simple to do these things because by the time we go through, you'll fully understand. Okay? So back to what this, this question this person asks. What we are saying, if you find that your schedule of eating is between 12 to 1 and your church service, the church you go to, ends at 
that means you would have missed your lunch time. You can't come out after church service and say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and eat now. No, you can't. And that's why we had stated the original statement. It says there should be a specified time for each meal. And it says regularity in eating is of vital importance. You, you know, so if you remember, if you listen to the first lecture, we would have set the foundation to bring us to this far. So it's important that individuals who are listening to tonight, you'd have listened also to the presentation previously because that set the foundation for the direction that I'm going in, where you'll have fully full understanding. So. Keep that in mind. Okay, so you see we have breakfast, 6 to 7 a.m. Right after breakfast, I mentioned to you to go and do a digestive walk. Okay, so now we're going to lunch. Lunch is 12 to 1. Right after lunch, you go and do a digestive walk. Supper is 6 to 6.30. Right after supper, you do a digestive walk. Basically, every time that you actually eat, a digestive walk needs to be followed. So just keep that in mind. Every time you eat, a digestive walk needs to be followed. Um, then once you have your meal set, your meal is set in, then you can go ahead and just end the, finish off the bottom portion of it, which is the, which is the time for evening worship. It's 30 minutes. Um, I recommend you do worship right before bed. Um, uh, some people will do it at set of sun. You can do it that way too. But then the thing about it, a lot of times you do your worship and then you go back and get involved in all different things and just totally set, send the mood, mood in a total different um, um, setting. Uh, so, you know, if you feel impressed to do the, mood, the, the, the evening worship right at the set of sun, you definitely can do that, but just know that you just got to watch everything you do after because you don't want to have worship and then, you know, get involved in certain things after. Um, I normally say try and get that worship, you know, more closer to, um, to the bedtime. And now if you have kids, then, you know, it's going to be earlier so that the kids would be involved in worship. Um, time for rest would be 9.30, and then by God's grace, you'd be asleep before 10 p.m. at night. So now that we have the back portion of the schedule finished, we can go forward right above breakfast. You can go right in and put that daily schedule in. Um, and we're just going to work backward. So you see breakfast was 6 to 7, so we're going to have time for exercise, 5 to 6 a.m., and then time to worship. 4 to 5 a.m., time to get up, 4 a.m. So just to kind of give you some heads up how that schedule is done. Um, I hope that was able to, I was able to kind of give some clarity on individuals who are looking to implement a three-meal schedule. So if you're looking to do a three-meal schedule, that would be the way that you'll do a three-meal schedule. Now, one of the things about three-meal schedule, three-meal schedule are very tough, they are rigid, they offer no flexibility, um, simply because you have to finish on time, start on time, and maintain tight times. Otherwise, if you don't maintain tight times, you'll throw off the rest of your schedule. Now, unlike a three-meal schedule, the two-meal schedule offers far much more flexibility. Uh, let me show you what I mean, for example. Breakfast is 7 to 8 a.m., okay? Uh, now, if for some reason you're still leaving home early, then we'd have just change it up a little bit different. You don't have to eat 7 to 8. Let's say someone was leaving home by 7. They could have breakfast 6 to 7 a.m. But if, you, if you're leaving home by 8 o'clock, you can actually push that breakfast back a little and eat breakfast 7 to 8. Same digestive walk, 15 minutes, okay? Um, then lunch, um, we are told in the spirit of prophecy, these are the writings by Sister Ellen G. White, that because the days have been shortened, we are advised to push the meals back just a little 
So in that way, an individual can consume two meals and be satisfied without the need of having an extra meal. Okay? So keep that in mind. We are told that the days have been shortened. Now, saints, if you don't think the days have been shortened, you st sit back and you see how quick Sabbath comes. Sab as soon as you wink, the week is over. You, you, you know? So basically, we have been advised that the days have been shortened, and because the days have been shortened, it would be good to consider um, pushing lunch back a little later. But for individuals who are in a situation where they cannot push the lunch that far back, you can have it a little earlier. You can have a one to two, okay? But just remember now, you still need to maintain that one to two seven days a week. Now, let me use myself. My breakfast time is six to seven in the morning, okay? My lunch time is one to two. And that's the time I eat seven days a week, no exception. My church ends at 12.30 on Sabbath. So when my church ends, I still have time to come home, heat up my food, and go right ahead and enjoy my meal. I also have time to fellowship with my brothers and sisters at church, you know, say hi. You know, sometimes I'm the last person that leaves church. And the funniest thing is that no big deal because I'm still working within my meal time. Um, so I maintain my schedule no matter what. Even when I travel, I travel from country to country, I'm able to still maintain my schedule. Um, I fly from one country to another. Um, I fly from Antigua to UK. I fly from Antigua to Canada. I fly from the US to Canada. You know what I mean? Uh, I've, gone, I've gone from Atlanta to California where there's major difference in time zones, and Antigua to the UK where there are five-hour time differences, and I'm able to still maintain schedule. I maintain schedule on the plane. I maintain schedule on land without any deviation, without any issue at all. So if individuals are determined that they're going to make this thing work, they will maintain their schedule also. I'll tell you this much. If for some reason my time, le okay, let's look at breakfast. I eat breakfast between 6 and 7 a.m. Let's say um, 7.01, just to kind of let you know how precise I am. Let's say 7.01 comes and I have not started my meals as yet. I will just sit back and I'll skip that meal in its entirety. And I would not eat until lunch meal. One of the things that I do, oh, and I got to tell you guys how the schedule works. With the two-meal schedule, you have this flexibility, which I'm about to explain. With the, the three-meal schedule, you do not have this flexibility that I'm about to explain. So with the two-meal, here's what you can do. Um, breakfast, let's go on the screen. I'm going to the screen. Breakfast is 7 to 8 if you look on the screen. The target time should be 7.30. You, remember this, you can come 30 minutes before breakfast or you can go 30 minutes after breakfast in terms of the time to get started. So if breakfast is 7 to 8 and your target time is 7.30, you can actually start breakfast at 8 o'clock. I'm sorry, you can start breakfast at 7 o'clock or, or as late as 8 o'clock, okay? But it's best if you try to hit that 7.30 timeline. The more precise you are in terms of hitting that timeline, the less issue you'll have with digestion. So you'll find that if you can hit that 7.30 all the time, you'll be amazed to see how well the stomach and the digestive system work. It works amazingly. Okay? So, so let's go here now. Breakfast, 7 to 8 a.m. This is the two-meal plan. Digestive walk, 15 minutes. So immediately after you finish eat, you start walking. 15 minutes, just a casual walk. That helps to massage the food down the stomach and facilitate digestion. Lunch, 2 to 3. 
digestive walk, 15 minutes again. Now, you can go 15 to 30. If somebody wants to go a little longer, blessed be the name of the Lord. But it's just a casual walk to help massage the food down. There's no supper. There's no digestive walk after supper. Evening worship again is your 30 minutes. And bedtime is 9.30. Now, I want to share this with you to let you see how flexible the two-meal plan is. The three-meal plan, the earliest you should go to bed on a three-meal plan is 9.30. The absolutely earliest on the three-meal plan you should go to bed is 9.30 because after you eat, you need to give the stomach um, at least three hours to, to kind of get rid of that which you put in for supper, okay? So if you're on now a two-meal plan, remember now you finish eating um, anywhere between two to three. You can actually go to sleep any time you want after six o'clock, okay? So the thing about the two-meal plan, you have the ability to go to sleep much earlier. You have the ability to, 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 to flex the start time, and when you continue. Like, for example, I mentioned, like breakfast, I mentioned between, let's say breakfast is between 7 and 8. Your target time would be 7.30, which means now you can eat 30 minutes before 7.30 or 30 minutes after 7.30. You can eat any time in between, no problem. Let's say you decide to start like minutes to 8. You obviously aren't going to finish by 8 o'clock, okay? You just take your time and eat, which you're going to go over the 8 o'clock, but you would have started before 8, and you have that flexibility of 30 minutes before or 30 minutes after. So you take your time and you eat, and you just eat until you finish. So if you start eating maybe 5 minutes to 8, and you finish 5 minutes to 9, no problem, okay? Um, five, let's say you start five minutes to eight and you finish 8.30, no problem. However, you'd have, have to make sure that you have enough space in between the time you finish and when you do the second meal. Now, if your second meal is at one o'clock, okay, if your second meal is at one o'clock, let's see if you have that flexibility that we just talked about. 8 to 12 is how many hours? That's 4 hours. 12 to 1 is 1, so that's 5 hours. Now, if you're eating 1 to 2, you don't have the flexibility, even though you're on a 2 meal, to go beyond the 8 o'clock time. I, I, I hope you're following me. But if you schedule the second meal between 2 and 3, then you have the flexibility where 5 minutes to 8 you start and you can eat until another 30 minutes, quarter to, quarter to 9, no problem, because you still have the flexibility of the 5 hours even if you end up at 9 o'clock when you started on time. I, 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 I hope you guys are understanding me here um, because there's some technicality here. But start on time, and if you give enough time between the breakfast and the lunch on the two-meal plan, you get a little bit more flexibility. So you'll find that if you go to my schedule, my schedule is 6 to 7 breakfast and 1 to 2 lunch. So 6 to 7, I have, five, I have 6 hours between my meal. So technically speaking, I have the flexibility where if I go over my 7 o'clock um, time, meaning that I would start on time, let's say I start 5 minutes to 7, and I finish by 7.30. No problem, because I have at least 5 hours. I have at least 6 hours between my breakfast and my lunch. So in that way, there'll be no conflict again with the meal being too close. I hope you guys are getting me right there. Um, so breakfast 7 to 8, 
digestive walk 15 minutes, lunch 2 to 3 p.m., digestive walk 15 minutes, and as I mentioned, on a two-meal plan, you can go to sleep as early as 6 o'clock if 3 p.m. is your cutoff time. Now, for individuals now on the three-meal plan, they have to go to sleep a little later because the food would have still been in their system. So time to get up, 5 a.m., time to worship, 5 to 6 a.m., time to exercise, 6 to 7 a.m., time for preparation. Preparation is daily. You always have to be preparing. Just like you prepare for the Sabbath, you always got to prepare, be preparing so in that way you stay on schedule. So I hope that the two-meal program there makes a little sense for individuals who are following me so far. Now, here's some basic principles we're going to go through as we advance through now. Now that you guys had a chance to see how the scheduling of meals took place, let's go ahead and advance through and set some other principles as we, as we get ready to, to, to put meals together. We're going to put meals together, but before we put meals together, we've got to set some basic things in line that tends to affect digestion which ultimately affects nutrition so if we put the right things in place it will not affect digestion will not affect nutrition and as a result you'll get the most out of your food so remember this avoid vigorous exercise immediately after a meal neither study or violent exercise should be engaged in immediately after a full meal this hinders the digestive process for the vitality of the system which is needed to carry on the work of digestion is called away to other parts. So, there are some basic principles. Neither study or violent exercise should be engaged in immediately after a full meal. You'll find that if you go ahead and do that, all of a sudden you get acid reflux. How did it come? Because you start studying the blood now leaves the stomach, goes to the brain to aid with the study. Food sits in the stomach and ferment. It sours. Okay? Um, so keep that in mind as we go. However, to aid digestion, however, to aid in digestion, take a short walk after a meal with the head erect and the shoulders back, exercising moderately, is a great benefit. So here are the basic principles. You want to aid digestion? It says take a short walk after a meal. That's called a digestive walk. Couple basic principles. Head needs to be what? Head erect and the shoulders back. So posture also plays a role in this thing. What is the best time to drink water? Someone may ask. We recommend that you start your day um, with some water. The first thing in the morning, you can do two to four cups of warm water. Two to four cups of warm water. And remember this, a half lemon per cup. Okay? A half lemon per cup or two tablespoons of lemon juice per eight ounces or a cup of water okay so let's go over that again when you first get up you can drink two to four cups of warm water two to four cups of what warm water and a half lemon per cup of warm water or two tablespoon of lemon juice per eight ounce of warm water okay make sure you use a straw because the acid in the lemon will destroy the dental enamel i remember the other day i was in new york and i was helping a young lady and she was just taking the the the, the lemon directly to her teeth when she went to her doctor doctor uh, correction when she went to her dentist the dentist said to her that he, he found that her teeth wasn't as healthy as she would have thought. And she says, Doc, what are you talking about? He said, I found that the dental enamel 
had completely eroded off of, off of your teeth. And she was there trying to figure out what was going on. And then when she came to a lecture and heard our lecture, she says, you know, Brother Luke, you know what I've been doing? Every morning I do that lemon um, and water, but I never use the straw to protect my teeth. And as a result, that acid in the lemon completely eroded, eroded her dental enamel. How long before meal should he drink water? You can drink water 15 to 30 minutes before a meal. But here's the situation. If you know that you have some digestive issue, you want to give yourself a little bit more time, you can do that about 30 minutes before meal. Now, if you don't have acid reflux, 15 to 30 minutes is fine. But if you have any level of digestive issue, be it GERD, be it gastritis, be it acid reflux, your belching, your burping, your farting, any, of, any forms of digestive issue, give yourself the extra 30 minutes. Okay? So keep that in mind. How long after a meal should we drink water? Um, two hours after is what we suggest. You may find many individuals may say, oh, uh, 30 minutes, one hour. But you'll find that if you bring that water so soon, you will still dilute the gastric juices. You will have some issues there. How best to drink water? This is what we suggest. We suggest that you do about one to two mouthful every 10 minutes. And the reason being is that the body can only handle two ounces of water at a time. So if you do one to two mouthful every 10 minutes, you will find that what that actually does, that will allow you to properly hydrate the body without flooding the cell. If you find that you're drinking too much water, what you'll find is that immediately after you drink or shortly after you drink, you'll be running to the bathroom during the day and at night you'll find yourself living in the toilet um, using the restroom. And when you do that, here's what happens. You do not hydrate yourself, but what you end up doing is demineralizing your body. You demineralize your body when you actually do that. You also do something too. You increase the intraocular eye pressure when you actually just go and gobble that water down. You know, if you just put that water in your head and you go goop, 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 what that does, it actually increases eye pressure if you do, that, do it that way too. So keep that in mind. There's a right way and a wrong way to consume your water. Other times to drink your water, Mid-morning is great, um, afternoon, into the night. Just drink until the urine is clear to pale. Um, you'll find that if someone is spending more time outside, they may require more water than someone who is in an air-conditioned building. The key is just drink until you are fine. Your urine should be uh, like a pale yellow to clear. Often feelings of tiredness and hunger are a reality thirst message that you need to be hydrated. If you find that you're actually thirsty, that means you have gone beyond the, the indicators. You, you know, you, you, you have gone beyond. You should never get to a point where you're so dry that the body has to send the indicator to you. Uh, liquid foods, smoothies, and drink. Too much soups are unhelpful. So much liquid taken into the stomach was not helpful, and that all who subsist on such a diet place a great tax upon the kidneys as so much watery substance debilitate, weaken the stomach. So listen to the instructions we have been given. People who are dealing with wondering, why am I dealing with kidney-related kidney issue? Why am I dealing with renal issue? Because of the constant eating and drinking, because of the constant soup where things are so liquidy, guess what happened? The kidneys is actually who goes in and start helping with the extraction of all that liquid so that digestion can start up again. So you put extra tax, tax, uh, what is it? tax on the kidney when you eat and drink, when you consume all these liquidy items and ultimately um, 
burn, overburden the kidney. So keep in mind that soups are, are not as healthy as someone who may try like a stew. You know, if you try a stew, stew tends to be thicker. So that tends to work a little better because then you can chew a stew versus you have to drink a soup, okay? Um, smoothies. Try your best to see how thick those smoothies can come. You'll find the more liquidy these items are, the more burdensome and harder they become on the kidneys, okay? So keep that in mind. Drinking and eating dilutes the stomach juices. Many make a mistake in drinking cold water with their meal. Food should not be washed down. Taken with meals, water diminishes the flow of saliva, and the colder the water, the greater the injury to the stomach. Now, saints, how many of you have been guilty of that? I can tell you that many of us over our lifetime have been guilty of this specific violation. So it says drinking with meals, Drinking and eating dilutes the stomach juices. It dilutes the stomach acid. So that's not something that you should do if you're looking to get the most out of your food. It says many make a mistake in drinking cold water. Why drinking cold water with the meal is wrong? Let's set this up. You got to remember the body's temperature is 98.6 degrees. So technically speaking, the body operates hot. The, the, the body is running hot. Are, are you with me? Now, cold water is far much more colder, so cooler than the body is actually running. So if you put something cold into a body that, that's normally running hot, it's going to shock the body, number one. Number two, what the body has to do is to actually stop and start warming that water up until it gets to that 98.6 degrees before it can literally start using it. And that's, that's the basically the basic problem when dealing with coal items. The body basically has to take that item and begin to warm it up. And during the warming up state, fermentation begins to take place. So remember this now. Food should not be washed down, taken with meals. Water diminishes the flow of saliva. And the colder the water, the greater the injury to the stomach. That's why the counsel is given. Let's say someone is on a, a two-meal plan and they feel peckish and they are hungry at night. The instruction that is given to us, take a drink of cold water and immediately you'll find that that need for that third meal will completely go away. Why taking that, that drink of cold water will get rid of that, that hunger pain? Because the, that drink, that cold drink will constrict the stomach as it constricts the stomach it shuts down digestion now with this principle being taught can you see the problem with the world today where they're drinking ice cold drinks with maybe pizza maybe with whatever food they're eating imagine let's go ice cold drink with pizza pizza you have bread and cheese with some tomato sauce over it right and you go and you drink that ice cold drink with that cheese over it right before you know it what you just did, you helped that cheese to solidify, to begin the plaquing process of those arterial walls. So one of the things that you want to do is definitely no eating and drinking at the same time and definitely leave out those cold items. Remember this, the enzymes in your mouth and stomach and it requires an internal temperature range of 95 and 105 degrees Fahrenheit for peak activity. So for these enzymes to function the way they need to function, they actually require that um, the internal temperature um, should be a little higher than even, um, um, uh, than even that regular room temperature water that you're bringing in. But what the body can do with that room temperature you're bringing in easily, it can, um, uptake that temperature without any problem. Um, cold or too hot internal temperature delays digestion of food. So that's why, again, too, um, extremely hot foods or, or cool, colder foods aren't good. That's why it's best to maintain that temperature um, close to the body's temperature.
ice water or ice lemonade taken with meals will arrest digestion until the system has imparted sufficient warmth to the stomach to enable it to take up its work again. Masticate slowly and allow the saliva to mingle with the food. The use of vinegar. Um, I know many of God's children are actually using this particular product as I'm speaking this evening. Now, if I was supposed to ask those very same individual, if it is okay that I take a drink of alcohol, many of them would be highly offended the fact that I mention whether or not I can take a drink of the scotch or the brandy, uh, you, you know, or the gin and tonic and those type of things. They'll be highly offended. Well, guess what? I get highly offended when I see God's children using vinegar. Why? Vinegar is actually alcohol fermented, okay? It's like they took the alcohol and fermented it, multi uh, fermented it down. It's already alcohol, and they ferment it beyond alcohol, and that's where they get vinegar, which is acetic acid. That stuff is so strong that they actually have to dilute it down to 5% or below because anywhere between 6 and 8 is considered radical vinegar. So just to let you know how potent this thing is, it is highly potent. It causes cirrhosis of the liver. Um, it can cause kidney failure. It dries the bone. It makes the bone brittle, dries the blood. Um, it, it punches holes in the gut. Uh, when I hear, I remember the other day, there was a gentleman at one of our churches, and he said he used to take a teaspoon of vinegar every morning, and one day he was in the bathroom, took a teaspoon of vinegar, and he passed out. They had to rush him to the emergency room because there was actually a hole in his stomach. Um, as a result of that situation. Saints, my recommendation to you, leave these things alone. Now, let's see what it says here. It says, vinegar ferments in the stomach, and the food does not digest, but decays or putrefies. As a consequence, the blood is not nourished, but becomes filled with impurities, and, and liver and kidney difficulties appear. Now, you know, just like how alcohol causes cirrhosis of the liver? Well, guess what? Vinegar also causes cirrhosis of the liver. Vinegar also causes kidney problem and kidney disease. And that's why we are counsel that these items should not be ingested. This increases inflammation in the blood, thereby taxing the immune system. So keep that in mind and please leave those vinegar alone. Drawbacks of vinegar. Acetic acid is anywhere between 4 to 12%. This is a toxic substance that, if taken in sufficient quantities, produces serious alter, um, alteration in the coagulative properties of the blood. So basically, here's what happened. You take adequate level of vinegar because of the high level of this acid it can actually dilute the blood so thin that the blood will no longer be able to, um, to basically coagulate. And you need the blood to coagulate in the event there's an injury or damage to the body. Like, for example, I remember I was in Barbados helping this one lady from Jamaica. She was in Barbados living there. And she said, Brother Luke, there's a surgery I have needed to do, uh, do for years but have not been able to do the surgery. And I asked her why. She says, my blood does not coagulate. Now, saints, as she and I began talking, we sat and we spoke for a while, I realized that where her violation actually came in is that she did not eat any vegetables. So her violation for her blood not coagulating, you know, she was deficient in vitamin K, that, that is with blood clotting, which you normally get from the green leafy, and the reason why she wasn't getting this is because she said she just didn't care for vegetables. She did not like vegetables. So um, as a result, she ran into some problem in that situation. It erodes the dental enamel, as we mentioned. It breaks down the, mu the mucus barrier that protects the mucous membrane of the stomach and causes gastritis. As it passes to the bloodstream, 
it causes anemia due to the fact it destroys the red blood cells. So one of the things you can, you, you can see, saints, this vinegar is not as good as it is being promoted as. I'm talking internally. Now, there is a way you can use this externally. Um, it's good for washing the feet, getting rid of calluses, um, getting rid of bunions, getting rid of, you know, if the feet is a little crappy and, and needs to be smoothed out and, and look real nice, vinegar will do that for you. You get like a pumice stone, and after you're soaking your feet there in the raw vinegar for at least about 20, 30 minutes, you can take that pumice stone and then just kind of um, sand away the dead flesh, or, um, the dead skin, and the feet will look amazing, okay? Um, however, vinegar should not be used internally. Now, all foods that contain vinegar should be eliminated completely from the diet. That's why in the council, one of the things that the council tells us is that the ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, mayonnaise, veginase, salad dressing, and pickles, all these items should be completely eliminated. We do not consume these items. Now, if you like ketchup, not a problem. We can teach you how to make your own healthy ketchup. You like uh, mayo, mayo? We can teach you how to make your healthy mayo. However, you're not allowed to buy the mayo that is being sold at the store. Some people say, okay, Brother Luke, um, what about um, uh, uh, mayonnaise or veginase? Saints, the same vinegar that is in the regular mayonnaise is in the mayonnaise, the veginase, and all of them. So which make these items unfit for our consumption? Okay, saints, it is better to actually literally make your own. If you make your own, so much more blessing actually comes from that situation. Now, the difference is when you make your own, it ain't going to last the one year or six months in your refrigerator like the ones that have the preservatives and the vinegar to help preserve it. Um, these only last about seven to ten days. So if you can look, you can see the difference. You, you know, normally whenever people buy mayo, you just stick the mayo in, and whether or not it's a month, two months, three months, you still go back and use the same mayo. Ketchup. Some may have ketchup in the refrigerator for six months, seven months, eight months, one year, two year, and no big deal. But guess what? If you go and make your own ketchup, you cannot let this thing sit so long. Otherwise, it grows mold and it's gone. So it is important to take this vinegar and the, all these chemicals that you can't even pronounce the name out of the, the, the recipe of items that you're using. It says here, condiments are injurious in their nature. Mustard, pepper, spices, pickles, and other things of a like character irritate the stomach and make the blood feverish and impure. The inflamed condition of a drunken stomach is often pictured as illustrating the effect of alcoholic liquors. A similar inflamed condition is produced by the use of irritating condiments. So, saints, if you really stop and really let's look, let's look this quote over a little. Because this quote is pretty deep. Because the Lord actually came back with something called a clearing house probe. A clearing house probe is where you make statements like things of a like character. That means if you're in doubt, take it out. You know, it basically takes anything that's similar to it, you got to get rid of it because of that statement. That statement is so broad in its sweep. It says condiments are injurious in their nature. Mustard, pepper, spices, pickles. Now, the, the word things of a like character came in there. So if words change or names change or new invention come, it says, oh, it's not there. Yes, it is. Things of a like character is what that specific item is. So it encompasses the other items that may not be listed, like the mustard, the pepper, and the spices, and the pickles. It encompasses everything else. And it says it irritates the stomach and make the blood feverish and impure. 
It says, the inflamed condition of a drunkard's stomach is often pictured as illustrating the effect of an alcoholic liquor. Now, saints, watch this. It even went on to say, a similar inflamed condition is produced by the use of irritating condiments. You know what I normally find? People who like spicy food, they're the very one that I tend to see that are smoking and the very one that I tend to see that are drinking. So, saints, one of the things you'll find is that these type of food, one of the things that Kongsa tells us will cause you to crave medication, it will cause you to crave alcohol, it will cause you to crave stronger stimulants or depressants. They will actually literally cause you. So it is extremely important that you keep the diet simple, you keep, you keep the seasoning simple. As a matter of fact, when people come, I remember one lady came, and, and she's a cook here in Antigua. She came, and when she tastes chef's food, she's like, um, you guys need to put more seasoning in the food. We said, no, we don't need to put no more seasoning in the food. What happened with your food, you're over-seasoning your food. That's the problem. And you, you put the pepper, you put all these different things. We don't do that. When chef cook, you're able to actually literally go in and pull out the flavor of the different individual item because of how good she seasoned the food. She doesn't over-season it, but she seasoned it where you can actually pull individual flavors out. Now, this individual want us, wanted us to put all different types of stimulating items in the food. We say absolutely not. Why? Because we have the blueprint. We understand the effect that will take place. A gentleman just came to the store the other day, and he eats from us, and he eats from others. And you know what he said? He says, James, I've got to tell you something. I find that whenever I eat chef's food, my stomach is quiet. But any time I eat out, he says, my stomach hurts, and I get a pain in my kidneys. And I said, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Makes all the sense in the world to me. And so... As a result, I said to him, well, why do you eat other folks, other folks' food? You know, the gentleman was just kind of, and it's not like we send them out testing. You know, he decides, let me go and try some other things. And every single time he eat out, his stomach hurts and his kidneys pain him. He eat the food that chef prepare, stomach does not hurt and kidneys does not, does not hurt him. It's absolutely amazing when you, when you look at the spirit of prophecy. It says hot pepper, chili, black, and white pepper. And remember that white pepper is the same as black pepper without the shell, okay? Has been shown to cause hemorrhaging of the stomach. As a matter of fact, um, these items, hot pepper, chili pepper, black and white pepper, they also cause high blood pressure. The blood is contaminated and inflammation is the sure result. Irritating spices to the stomach are um, ginger should not be dear, okay? So uh, take ginger out, okay? Cloves, cinnamon, nutmeg, caraway, all spice, vinegar, and anything made with vinegar should be discarded um, in meal preparation. So allow me to just go in here, and I'm going to just go ahead and clear that ginger out. So in that way, it will say it the way that I would like for it to say it. And the reason being, um, ginger is actually excellent for digestion, but the only problem that you encounter is that sometimes people may have hypertension. And if they have hypertension, we know that ginger also have a tendency of raising the blood pressure. So ginger is excellent for digestion, um, but um, if someone is dealing with high blood pressure, we know that it will elevate the blood pressure. So your irritating spices would be cloves, cinnamon, nutmeg, caraway, allspice, vinegar, and anything made with vinegar should be discarded in meal preparation. Now, saints, I want to share something now. There are medicinal properties in cloves, cinnamon, and nutmeg. Now, 
you'll find that if someone used cloves in um, like toothpaste, we found that cloves are good when it comes to infection, inflammation, to pain, any type of dental issue. We found that in actuality, clove and cinnamon are excellent in any type of dental issue. Cinnamon even goes as far now as excellent when it comes to helping and managing blood sugar issue. So if someone has blood sugar issue and we use some cinnamon tea, we can easily help to bring that blood sugar down where we can get control. So clove, cinnamon, nutmeg, these items can be used medicinally. They can be used as a medicine or should not be used from a dietary standpoint. Now, when it comes to nutmeg, nutmeg is absolutely poisonous, okay? However, if someone has a stroke, you can actually use nutmeg to completely reverse the stroke. Um, I have done it several times, and it works amazingly. So keep that in mind. It says, spices at first irritate the tender coating of the stomach, but finally destroys the natural sens sensitiveness of this delicate membrane. The blood becomes fevered. The animal propensities are aroused, um, while the moral and intellectual powers are weakened and become servants of a baser passion. So, saints, one of the things, you know, when you read that, you're like, really? Now, here's something that you may not have known. You see those very same spices that I'm talking about taking out of the diet? Did you know that these very same spices are aphrodisiac? They actually help to stimulate one's sexual passion. So as you read the quote here, it is fully supported by Cyan, where it says that the blood becomes fevered, the animal propensities are arose, while the moral and intellectual powers are weakened and become servants to, to the baser passion. Okay, so keep that in mind when, uh, when dealing with these stimulating spices as we are instructing you to leave these alone. Frying of foods. Food should be prepared in a simple manner, free from grease. Avoid fried foods, hydrogenated fats, and oils. Grease cooked in the food renders it difficult of digestion. Now, saints, one of the things that you'll find is that the way we cook at our restaurant, okay, we do not use any grease in the preparation of our food. Now, if we have a pan that we have to, you know, we put something in the oven and we just kind of put a little grease on the pan to make sure that things don't stick, um, or we have something called a towel that we will wipe, some, wipe it with oil, one, to make sure it doesn't rust, and two, so in that way we can actually do some, we, we're going to basically dry fry um, tofu on it. So there are times that we're doing tofu, and we'll just dry fry it on there. So we don't do it in oil. We just wipe the towel. Um, th that's what um, Sister Nash and everybody else uses in Trinidad to make rotis. You, you know what they do to make their roti skins? They make that on that t um, towel. Uh, tower, um, tower. I think. Uh, mm -hmm. well, uh, the Indians call it tower. Um, I would also call it like a hot plate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's what it is. Okay, praise the Lord, you know. Um, uh, Sister Nash is from Trinidad, so if there's anybody knows how to, to pronounce those type of names, it would be Sister Nash. Amen? So, um, so that, we just grease it just to make sure nothing sticks to it, but we do not use any oil um, in the preparation of anything. And so it says here, grease cook in the food renders it difficult of digestion. So some people, you put oil in the food, and you're wondering why you're having problems with the food, because you're cooking the food with oil. We do not recommend that you use oil in the food. Plus also, too, you know, some people are making a salad dressing, and they, go, they do some olive oil with some lemon juice and different things in their salad dressing, and they pour it over the salad. That's the worst thing that you can actually do because now what you would have done, that nice salad 
that should be easily digestible, now it becomes very difficult for that salad to be digested because of the oil that has been placed upon that salad. So one of the things you need to keep in mind is that whenever you're putting your salad dressings together, do not put any oil on your salads because it renders the digestion very difficult. So what I'm going to do right here, I'm going to pause right here. We're going to stop right here and open it up for Q&A.